Well, good morning, Grace Fellowship Church. Y'all doing okay this morning? Come on, they said 30, third service is a little rowdier, so y'all doing okay today? Hey, the sermon notes are going to be up on the, on the screen. You can um, scan that. You can follow along uh, there through the Bible app with that. Um, we jump in. I want to honor Pastor Josh. Come on, y'all have an amazing pastor. Come on, make some noise for this amazing man right here. Um, you know, like he said with the, his name, oh, well, Pastor Tanner, come on, that was amazing. The whole, you know, Avengers, come on, somebody. Um, this is why I said, I said, he must be Tony Stark then. Come on, bringing us all together. Tony Stark, I see it. I see he's got the beard, the glasses. Tony Stark, bringing us all together. But no, I just, I want to honor him and just say, uh, you know, just getting to know him and his heart to bring all of us together. You know, the Bible teaches us that pastors, um, that Jesus gives gifts to the church, one of those being pastors. So I want you to know he is a gift to you, to this church, to this place and this space. And you're not just a gift to Grace Fellowship Church, you're a gift to us and you're a gift to the churches here in Lawton. And uh, I'm grateful for you. I'm better because I know you. And uh, even this morning, just your heart for your congregation, your people, I mean, it's just, it's so real, it's so tangible, and i um, just grateful to know you. One more time for Pastor Josh. Now, how about for Jesus Christ? Make some noise for Jesus. Come on, come on. Um, it's so good to be with y'all. Uh, like uh, Pastor Josh said, my name is Eli Garcia, and I flew all the way in from Cash, Oklahoma. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Bulldogs, Bulldog Nation. Um, no, I graduated from Cash, my wife from Eisenhower, and um, my wife, y'all, uh, I was able to get the girl out of Eisenhower, but it's hard to get the Eisenhower out of the girl, you see what I'm saying? I'm still trying to get her saved, so help me, been through some prayer and all the things, but uh, I want to show you a picture of my family. I heard a preacher say one time that if you show a picture of your family, people will listen to you better, so we're going to find out. <clears throat> this is my, my family and my amazing kids, sometimes, sometimes. I got five kids, um, and if you're counting, there you're probably counting four. And so you may think my numbers, my math is off because I went to cash. It's not. Um, we had five kids. What I didn't tell you is that in, um, in 2014, um, we buried a daughter. We buried a baby. And this was her funeral. That's her coffin. Um, my wife was on her way to work one morning, and um, there at Dale and Cash, somebody runs a stop sign, gets T-boned by a vehicle, F-250, heading into Lawton from Cash, T-bones um, this vehicle, and they would both slam into my wife's vehicle as she's headed to work. As a result, we would lose our second child, um, L, and, um, and in this this whole weird situation, the person that ran the stop sign would actually be her cousin. He was going to be a senior in high school that next year, and his dad said, you're not going to lay around the couch all summer. You need to go find a job. And so he went to drive to his uncle Danny's um, lawn mowing business shop to ask for a job that summer. And as he was headed there, as Sheridan was headed there, um, he ran the stop sign. And so we didn't, and he was killed on impact. So we didn't just have to bury a baby, but we had to bury a cousin. And you might probably be thinking this is a unique way to start a sermon. And, um, <clears throat> and I agree. And so the reason I start a sermon like this, I've never done it like this, but the reason I do is because, well, you asked for it. <laughs> you asked for it. Pastor Josh said that whenever this question came in, why does God give such tough battles to people who are faithful to him? He said, he said, yeah, I just thought of y'all's story. Not just the battle of burying a baby, but the battle of trying to build his church and the opposition and the struggle. And you're trying to do the will of God. You're trying to, but you're yet you're facing opposition. And somehow y'all been able to stay faithful. Would you come and, and I thought, I don't know if I want to. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to come, you know, just preach a happy, God loves you, you know. But I said, absolutely. And so that's why I start the sermon like that, because you asked for it, and so he asked me. And so really, um, I wanted you from the beginning for you to know that 
from the beginning of this conversation that I'm not, not speaking from a place of, or a position of hypothetical conjecture, meaning like what, like in a what if idea formed without proof that I want you to know that I hurt too. I've experienced pain too. And yet through the trial and the trouble, I still trust Jesus. I still love Jesus. I'm still, I'm still gonna serve Jesus. And simply this, and maybe this is my hope for you today is that you can walk out of here even with just a glimpse of this, saying this, I have decided to trust that God is good even when life is not. In fact, it's the more faithful, like the more faithful you are means the more frightened the enemy is. Therefore, he fights you. And so the size of your battle tells me the size of your assignment. Y'all, I went to a Dallas Cowboy game last year. Listen, listen, listen. I don't know if I would go this year. I'm just gonna throw that out there. I'm gonna save my gas money. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I went to a Dallas Cowboy game last year. Y'all, I even wore a Dallas Cowboy jersey. And not one time did anybody try to come and tackle me. Not one time did any of the opposing team try to come and block me. Why? Because I didn't have what they wanted. I never had the ball. In fact, I wasn't even on the field. I was in the stands. What I want to say is this. The moment that you step onto the field of faith, you better get ready to fight. In fact, it's like, like the moment that you step into this thing, this following Jesus, you start going to Grace Fellowship, you go to Growth Track, you're going to go to the Commons, you know, you're going to say, I'm, I'm going to do all the things. I'm, a, I'm in this thing. I'm going to jump on the team. I'm going to be a part of it. That moment, like, I want you to know, I grew up three generations of pastors. I always had this assumption that if, when you said yes to Jesus, it was supposed to be rainbows and butterflies. But I found out it's more like, it's more like a fight at, like at every turn. And in fact, I heard an old preacher say this one time. He said, if uh, you haven't had a head-on collision with the devil in a while, it's probably because you're going the same direction. So the size of your trial tells me the size of your assignment. Following Jesus, like, we realize what we're signing up for. A man that went to a cross, was beaten, <laughs> hung, died, like, like, that's what we're deciding to sign up for. The moment you step onto the field of faith, you better get ready for a fight. And so as I was thinking through this, where we would go with this, uh, I found this person in the Bible that you're probably familiar with, this story in the Bible, Job, a faithful man in an unfair battle. So I just want to open us up with chapter 42, Job 42. Anybody got a Bible, like a real Bible? Let me, if you just hold it in the air like you just don't care. Come on. Come on, they got real Bibles here, honey. <laughs> they have actual paper, paper Bibles at this church. Come on. Trying to, get the, trying to get people with paper Bibles, you know. Um, Job 42, verse 1, 2, and 3. I just want to open us up with this. It just reads like this. It says, Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Here it is. Job said this. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. If you're taking notes, I, I just have this title for you. And maybe it's my hope that you could walk out of here with just a little bit of this. Thinking in your mind and in your heart and in your soul. That, that you could walk out with this as you follow Jesus, as you trust Jesus. I don't need to understand. Sometimes in life, the things that I go through, the, the trials, the trump, like, Sometimes, maybe, just maybe, I don't need to understand. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would speak today, that any word that comes from my mouth and not from your heart, God, it would fall on deaf ears. But every word from your mouth to your people, God, I pray that it would sink in, that you would do what I cannot. I pray that today you would get all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Grateful to be here, these amazing people. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said amen. Come on, Grace Fellowship, if you love Jesus, make some noise in this place. Um, um, I've never preached specifically or exclusively from Job's story. Solely from Job's story. I probably moments I've used passages, but, but I've never preached specifically from his story. So um, I'm going to need y'all's help today. Is that okay? Y'all, we're down there on the south side, and they like to talk back to a preacher. Y'all like to talk back to a preacher here? Okay, third, okay, oh, okay. So I, let's just practice. Would y'all help me? Would y'all help me? Help me. Okay, so I'm gonna say something and then you just repeat it. This is a practice moment, just getting us ready, okay? So everyone just say, preach that. Preach that. Say, that's good. that's good. Say, you on it now. On it. 
Say, come on. Come on. Say, preach it, brown boy. <laughs> the most was this one, okay? So I'm praying for all of y'all. I was thinking, surely this is the sanctified crowd, but I guess. <laughs> no, um, I think that this thing kind of happens together. And uh, if you hear something you agree with, the Bible, the word, you can just, you can shout a little bit. In fact, the faster, or the more you shout, the faster I preach and the quicker we can get out of here. Can I get a good amen? <laughs> Whoa, they're ready to go. All right, okay. All right, all right. Um, so I want to ask you this question by a show of hands. Who in the room has ever been into an altercation? Anybody ever been into an altercation? I know we're in the shady, but I'm not talking about physical, but maybe just, just like a verbal altercation. Anybody been in a verbal altercation? I think everybody in the room. Everybody here. I've been married for 12 years, y'all. 12 years. First, experience, first service, I said uh, 10. She had to correct me. I was just making sure she was right. Make sure she was, she was listening to the, to the message. We've been married for... For 12 years, and uh, I thought about this because um, I met her. Her dad was starting uh, at the time Word Alive Church in his living room. We were juniors um, in high school, sophomore juniors in high school, and my parents would start going to the living room while her dad was starting uh, the church. And so my parents start going, and my sister, who's five years younger than me, she's like, "You got to go to this. You got to go to this Bible study." Um, I'm like, I am not going to church on a Friday night if mom and dad don't make me. And so she's like, no, 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 no. There's this girl there. I said, I'm listening. <laughs> she said, there's this girl there. She's leading kids church. And, and it's like, I'm like, kids, they got a kids church in this house? She's like, well, it's her nephew and niece, you know, and she's got a felt board. I'm like, a felt board? Come on. Anybody remember the old felt boards? Come on, put Noah's Ark up there, the, you know, the do like all the animals. And so I'm like, no, I am not. And then all of a sudden, though, I looked her up on MySpace. Come on, somebody. Anybody remember MySpace? Come on. I, she's like, yeah. MySpace. Kids will never know what it meant to have your own theme song. Come on. Mine was Boulevard of Broken Dreams. <laughs> I looked her up on MySpace, and I told my mom that, that Friday. I said, Mom, I'm going to church with you all this Friday. She said, why? I said, I just want to meet Jesus. She said, you want to meet a girl? I said, yeah, I do. So I would go, and that's where I would meet her. She's leading kids' church there, and I've just been blessing her life ever since, y'all. Amen. That's not the true story. One of these days, maybe I'll tell you. But I met her there, and I remember the, the day that we were getting married, um, her dad came up to me, and he gave me some advice, some father-in-law to son-in-law advice. He said, he said, son, I'm going to give you some advice. And he said, um, she's like her mama. I said, Okay. He said, so you're going to have to learn to pick your battles. I'm like, cool, good, thank you. I'm like, I'm just ready to get to the honeymoon. You know what I'm saying? Like, can we leave now? Is it can we go? And so we go to the, we, I took her to the Oklahoma City Zoo. Come on. I took her to the Oklahoma City Zoo. Come on, save some money. If you're, if you're engaged, save some money. Go to the Oklahoma City Zoo. Stay there a couple days. It was amazing. Best honeymoon ever. In fact, though, I was thinking about it, um, this, this idea of going to the zoo, like it was really a picture of what our marriage would look like over the next three years. Like, like chimps throwing food at each other, birds yelling at each other, lions chasing each other around a cage. Y'all, we fought over everything. Everything. We fought over everything. And eventually, at some point, this idea of what her dad told me, pick your battles, actually set in. And so now, y'all, after 12 years... I have finally learned to pick my battles. Everyone stretch your hands to this section. Like, like after 10 years, if she still doesn't know how to load the dishwasher right, is it really worth me waging war over? No. I just put it the way it's supposed to be. You're not supposed to put spoons with forks and forks with knives. No. I just fix it, and I just do it, and I say nothing. I say, thank you, Lord, for giving me this woman to serve. It's not worth waging a war over. I have learned to pick my battles. Here's my point. What happens when the battle picks you? What happens when the battle picks you? Like, what do you do when something shows up at your doorstep that you didn't order from Amazon Prime? <laughs> when the devil drops something off for you to deal with that you don't deserve, like you didn't directly cause or choose or definitely anticipate. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I like her. Can, I'm just going to have you at the house. All the Amazon packages that come to the house, I'm just going to have you just return to center, okay? All of, all of them. Um, no, what happens whenever a pain picks you with a purpose that you cannot see? And so this idea of pain, like I just want to be really honest with you. Um, 
like, I was just a police officer before this. I come from three generations of pastors. Like, I've got a lot of learning to do and all this stuff. And, and so I, I, I'm not even going to pretend to be able to answer all of your questions. I can't. I, I wouldn't even try to. I wouldn't even try to answer your questions. But when I was thinking about this idea of pain, I do see in the Bible clearly that there are some, some, some pains in the Bible, some, some, like, reasons for it. Here it is. Here's one. Um, this idea of pain. There's some pain with the purpose of growing us. Like James, Jesus' brother, he said, it is the testing of your faith. The testing of your faith that causes perseverance, causing you to be made mature, complete, lacking nothing. So there is a, like some things that we go through that have the purpose to, to help grow us. It's like going to the gym. Like if you go to the gym, you're tearing muscle fibers. And the, the whole purpose of this is that you begin to grow stretching you so you can you can grow your muscles can grow and there's some things that happen in your life like like in one moment one season it looks like it's there to break you but realizing looking back that it was actually there to help make you like the biggest battle this is the biggest battle I've gone through but two years from now you're looking back and you realize that it was the biggest blessing that you've gone through there are some some pain, some things that we go through that we understand the why is that God is trying to grow us and stretch us and help us become who he's called us to be. And then there's another type of pain. There's another type of pain. This pain is for those that have said, I have decided to follow Jesus. And there may be people in the room or watching that have not quite made that decision yet. And so we're thankful that you're here. But, but if you're in the room and you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, like there are some pains that we cause ourselves by stepping outside of God's best for our life. You know, the Bible is given to us to help teach us how God wants us to operate in this life. And so there's some things that we do. We step outside of God's best. It could be in the area of relationships. And like, you know, if you're married, but yet you step outside of the boundaries of your marriage, you realize, I don't know why I'm going through all of this. It's because you stepped outside of God's best for your life. And then there's some others, like maybe it could be in the area of finances. In your finances, you're like, you're like, well, you're frustrated with God because you can't pay your bills. God, I don't know. I thought you said I was supposed to do that, have this and have that. I can't pay my bills. God, why can't I do that? And God's like, because you have decided to not bring first back the tithe. And so because you're not following my word, you can't receive my blessings. It's like my son. I say, Axel, take out the trash. Then you can watch the new Transformers. So if he wants what I have to offer, I have to do what he asks. Can I get a good Amen. And so there are some battles that we step outside of God's best and we find ourselves, and that's the reason why we're having all these problems. We can't blame God. We can't blame the devil. We've got to look in the mirror. And then I think of that idea, the personal problems we picked over personal preference instead of divine guidance. But today, though, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this. What happens about the battles that, that pick you? And there seems to be no reason for the season of struggle that you're walking through. Come on, where are the people at in the room that say, I trust God, but I just don't understand? I believe God is working it for my good. I just can't see the good. So this is what drew me to this story, Job. And not just the content, but rather the context. You see, Job is in a part of the Bible known as the wisdom literature. Everybody say wisdom literature. It's in this section known as the wisdom literature. You see, the Bible is not arranged in chronological order. It's arranged in sections a lot like a bookstore. And so if it was arranged in chronological order, Job's story is about 2,000 years B.C. And so it's believed that uh, by most theologians that Job's story in a chronological order would be before or during Abraham's life. But there's some reason that it is put in this wisdom section within these other certain books. And I believe that it is in this section, God is putting it right here, to give us wisdom that will help you endure Job-like seasons. Eli, what's Job-like seasons? They are seasons of adversity that you must endure without understanding the reason. Seasons of adversity that you must endure without understanding the reason. In fact, it is um, this idea of trust or faith, the evidence of that means there's an absence of understanding. If Peter was going to step out of the boat on water, 
but knew the water was going to catch him, right? It wouldn't take faith. It wouldn't take trust. But it was the fact that he didn't know that's where the trust came in. The faith came in. And so we pick up the story, Job 1. We started in 42 just to kind of give us a place where we're going. But Job 1, this is where the story starts. It says, there once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and he stayed away from evil. I'm like, that's a good resume. That's good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I don't know how you read the Bible, but when I read the Bible, I picture it out in my mind. So I'm picturing this whole conversation, this whole scene in my, my mind. And so as I'm reading this story, um, you can go and read it this week, but, but it says that. And then all of a sudden, um, the Bible says that the angels are having audiences with God. They're bringing stuff to God. So this is what I picture. God is having a staff meeting and his executive team is coming forward. And as they are, he's like, he looks around, and they're all in line. He's like, Satan, hey, how'd you, what are you doing? Come here. What, he, he gets up to God. He's like, what are you doing? He's like, nothing, nothing, chilling, chilling. He's like, where you been in the Bible? He said, he said, well, I've been here, there, to, fro. He's like, I've been on the north side, been on the south side, been in Lawton. You know, I've just kind of been all over the place. And then all of a sudden, verse 8, this is what really confused me within the text. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, God says something that really gets me. God says, have you considered my servant Job? I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You just said that he's blameless. He fears God. He hates evil. Like he's got a man of integrity. And now you are recommending him to be the recipient of satanic opposition. And then I realized this. Satan didn't pick Job. God picked Job. I had to go back and read it a couple times in different translations. I'm like, hold on. I grew up, I always thought it was Satan that came to him. and was like, hey, I want to mess with Job. No, no, no. It was God who puts Job in Satan's mouth. I'm thinking, that's just foul. <laughs> we'll come back to that, I promise. So he comes to him. He's like, he's like, I've been here, there, to, fro, roaming the earth, all this. And he's like, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan's like, well, does Job fear God for no reason? Of course he is faithful to you because you have a hedge of protection around him. You protect everything that he, that he has. And then all of a sudden I asked this question to myself. I'm like, okay, um, God didn't tell him there was a hedge of protection. Job didn't tell him there was a hedge of protection. I'm thinking, who told him there was a hedge of protection? Unless he tried to get to Job before but couldn't because God was protecting him. Unless he tried before to get to Job, but he couldn't because there was a hedge that God had around him that was protecting him. And I know there's times that we complain about the battles that we're in, but listen, what about the battles that you don't even know about? The attacks that, that could not get to me because God was protecting me. Oh, we ought to give God a shout of praise for protecting us when we couldn't even see it. When I was late to work, I had no idea the late was for a reason, that there was going to be a car that was going to run the red light. And if I would have been on time when I thought I was supposed to be on time, my daughter didn't come up to me and said, Daddy, Daddy, can you come turn on the whatever? I don't even know what shows they watch anymore. Can you come turn on the TV? And I'm like, babe, I'm in a hurry. I'm in a rush. I had no idea that the late was for a reason because the car was going to run the red light and that put me in the wheelchair the rest of my life. But God was protecting me. Y'all, I grew up, I'm telling y'all, I three generations of pastors. My grandpa used to do them tent revivals, y'all, like, like for days and weeks. I grew up in there, and I thought about this whenever I read this portion. Like, I remember them old church moms, they used to say something like this. When I think of the goodness of God and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. hallelujah. We ought to shout hallelujah in here. For all the moments God protected us, I promise you, there's going to be moments when you get to heaven and you're going to realize, wow, God was protecting me there. He was protecting me there. He saved me there. He made me turn there. There was a roadblock here, but I had to go this way, and God was protecting you. Come on. Some of you, if you would be with the person that you thought you were going to be with, oh, your life would be, ooh. Thank God you go back to your 20-year reunion. You're like, God, thank you, Jesus. Woo, dodged the bullet there. I think there's a country song that says something about thank God for, uh, was it unanswered prayers? Amen. I'm from Cash. I know them songs now. Come on now. We ought to give God a shout of praise just for all those moments. So they're having this conversation. God says, all right. All right, Job. He's like, he's like he, he, the only reason he's faithful to you is because you, you protect him. He's like, cool. I'll, you can try. Mess with them. Do what you want. 
But just don't touch him. Satan's like, cool. He leaves. He goes down. All of a sudden, the Bible tells us that a servant runs up to Job, and he's like, hey, all your oxen and donkey have been taken. And, and he's like, what? What? And the, your, your cattlemen, they've been, they've been killed. And then another servant runs up to him, and he's like, your sheep and your shepherds, they died in a fire. And then all of a sudden, another one runs up to him. He's like, your camels and your servants, they've been, they've been killed. And then another one runs up to him, and they're like, there was this, this windstorm, this tornado, this like in Oklahoma, and it came. And like this house and your kids were in it and it killed all of your kids. And I thought about this. This is Satan's strategy to overwhelm us back to back to back. Come on, have you ever felt that? Like, like, like I know it's not supposed to be perfect, God. I know you said it's not supposed to be easy. Nobody ever said it was gonna be easy. I know, God, that you said that. But can I just get a season so I can breathe. <laughs> can I just get one week where there's not a problem? Can I just get one week where I don't get a phone call that my daughter's been arrested? Is there just, can there, is there just, can I get a day that I can find out that my husband's faithful? Can I just, can I just have one day, God, please, God, please. I just need a season where I can breathe. Back to back to back to back. And I realize this. Sometimes the devil knows in order to take you out, he has to wear you down. And this breaks the average person. It doesn't mean that they're weak. It just means that they're human. They're human. They're tired. Job 120 tells us this. Job stood up after hearing all of this, after hearing his kids and everything and all the things. Job stood up. He tore his robe in grief. He shaved his head and he fell to the ground to worship. To worship. King James Version puts the next verse like this. Job says this, The good Lord giveth and the good Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 22, all of this Job did not sin by blaming God. Tells me that my praise is not predicated on my predicament. I'm not praising God because life is good. I'm praising God because God is good. (laughs) I think about our story. We lost our daughter, and in the moment, it's like I'm trying to be tough for my wife, and like so I don't like it. It's, it's kind of it was so quick and so fast, and we're so young, and we got another daughter. We're still raising, and all this stuff, and and so like in the moment, it was like I just kind of a blur. But I remember a couple years later, we had my son Axel. He's he's about two years old, and he starts getting sick. The doctors don't know what's the matter, and so they take him to run some tests, and, and they tell us that he had, a, he had a rare blood disease. And I call, I call, I call. My mom had worked at the hospital. She said, son, it's not good. It's not good for, 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 for babies. It's not good for the elderly. Like, son, this ain't good. This could, this could kill him. I remember I was, had just gotten off of work. I was a police officer. We had a training day, and it was a Wednesday, and I remember I'm leaving Votech for where we had our training and I'm driving home and I've got to got, try to go and get a couple hours of sleep because I got to show up on a Wednesday night to preach to some youth students that God is good. I just get this news that my son probably is not going to live. And I could just be just honest with you. I'm driving home and I'm crying and I'm like, God, why? God, what have I done? God, where in my life am I met? Like, have I messed something up? What am I doing? God, I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to be a good man. I'm trying to be a good husband. I'm trying to, like, I'm trying, God. Like, but why? Like, I, God, I, you took a daughter from me? This is what I'm saying to God. You, you took a daughter now? You got to take my son? I'm sobbing in my car. And I put some worship music on and I came to this point where I just sat in my car with tears in my eyes. God, if he lives or dies, I'm still going to trust you. God, if Axel doesn't make it, I'm still going to serve you. I'm still going to trust in you. I'm still going to believe in you. For I have decided to follow Jesus. I showed up. I went home, got, an, got, the, got some sleep, and went and preached to some, 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 some youth group students, and some of them met Jesus. I remember a couple days later, it was a miracle. They ran some more tests, and they said he had nothing in his blood. It was a miracle. But I'm telling you this, in that moment, I resolved within my heart that if he lived or died, I was going to follow Jesus. I think of you and your story. 
Everything the devil's tried to do, every, all the attacks, all the loss, all the hurt, all the heartache that you've gone through. And you're, you're still right here back at Grace Fellowship Church today, this Sunday, raising up the name of Jesus. I think of it, Satan tried, but he didn't succeed in your life. <laughs> He's back to, he goes back, Satan goes back to God. <laughs> Why? Because what he took wasn't what he wanted. You see, the battle that you're in, he's not after your stuff. Come on, he's not after your furniture. He's after your faithfulness. He's after all of all of your, like, you believe your trust in God. After all that, you got Satan spinning the block, coming back to God. Because he don't know what to do with you. So he goes back and God's like, told you so. Ha, huh? You thought you could get him. He's like, well, that's, I messed with his stuff, but you didn't let me mess with him. Let me mess with him. Let me get, let me, and he's like, you can try, but it won't work. That was like, cool, he's gone. All of a sudden, now the Bible tells us that, that in Job chapter two, that he gets sick in his body. He gets sick in his body. Job gets afflicted, and then his wife comes up to him. His wife comes up to him. Now, come on, like, I know sometimes his wife gets a bad rap, but you can't blame her. She's suffering from caretaker fatigue. She's lost everything. She's lost her kids. She's lost the business, everything. She's lost everything. And now she's having to care for her husband. And like the Bible says that he can, he's got scabs in his body and all this stuff and he's sick and she's trying to care for her husband and she's watching him in pain. And so she finally just says this. She says, why don't you just curse God and then you can die? Do you notice the same language that she tells her husband is the same language that Satan told God? Like, you can't be mad at her. Why? Because pressure will make you say things that you don't mean. But she says the same thing that God says, or Satan says to God. Why? Because Satan used the pressure that she was under to implant a thought in her head to help to come and try to confuse her husband. You see, sometimes in your life, you think your enemies, like, do you think the people that, that Satan uses are your enemies, people that you don't like? No, no, no. Sometimes he'll use the people that are closest to you. Some of the greatest trauma that we experience comes from people that are supposed to protect us. Everything he went through, though, everything he went through, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Job breaks down and he begins to question God. He says, I've been faithful. Why am I in this battle? Why am I going through this? The Bible says God is silent. Job is so frustrated. He's so, like, he's, he actually says, he said, curse be the day that I was born. I should have died, like, on my, in my mother's womb. He's like, he's like, God, just kill me now. I'm done with it. I'm done. Take me, take me, take me. I'm done with it. All this, he questions God, but he never curses God. He breaks. The Bible says God is silent until chapter 38. All of a sudden, God breaks in in a whirlwind, the Bible says, and God comes in. He's like, hold up. Let me ask you something, Job. Let me ask you a little something, Job. Since you think you know what I should be doing with your life, since you, since you think you know, Job, let me ask you a little something. Let's have a conversation. He says, where were you whenever I set the foundations of the earth? He said, Job, where were you? You see those stars up there hanging in the sky? I do that. The sun, I tell the sun when to rise. The moon, I tell it when to set. God's like, the, the waters, I tell the waters where to stop. Job, since you know, though, best what I should be doing as God, please tell me what I should be doing, Job. And then all of a sudden, Job's like, oh, Job's like, my bad. Job 40, verse, verse, verse 1, chapter 40, verse 1, he said, Then the Lord said to Job, Do you still want to argue with the Almighty? Are you God's critic trying to post on Facebook? But do you still have the answer? I think Job's like, I should have picked my battles. <laughs> and then he says, verse 42, he said, surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Everything he went through, he questioned, but he never cursed God. And the Bible tells us the end of the story, you can read it. God restored unto Job twice as much. That's a great Great story, but this is what really had me confused this week. 
Because nowhere in the story does God ever tell Job why. I'm like, God, you never tell Job, why don't you at least tell him why, what was going on? You never told him why. <laughs> now we know because we know the story. We see that we have the Bible. Job didn't have the Bible. Job only had a scene in the Bible. We know why, because like this idea that God and Satan, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? Because God picked him. I'm thinking, okay, why would God do that? So here's a guess, okay? It's a good guess. This is maybe not absolute for everybody. Pastor Josh taught me this one. This is me using my holy imagination. I heard a Bible teacher, Darius Daniels, pointing out this theological thought of representative warfare. I thought, what's that? What's that? So I did this like, like study into like representative warfare. It is this idea that you opposing armies, what they would do is they would pick their best fighters and whoever wins individually represents us collectively. So it'd be like David and Goliath. Like David, if you win, all Israel wins. Goliath, if you win, the Philistines win. It could be in the area of like intercessory prayer. Like I am interceding on someone else's behalf. Remember, we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but of, but of spirits and principalities of the sayings of the unseen world. And so intercessory prayer, your pastors, whenever they're praying for you through the week, what are they doing? They are interceding on your behalf, fighting on your behalf. Representative Warfare, this idea. Satan wasn't after exclusively, he wasn't fighting Job, he was fighting God through his attacks against Job. Billy Garham, he said this about Job's trials. He said, he said, it is a reflection of the spiritual conflict between God and Satan, the cosmic battle between good and evil. He said, Job's steadfast trust in God serves as a testament of God's divine sovereignty and the human endurance in faith. You see, if Job wins, God wins. He can say, devil, you tried but didn't succeed. And I think of this, maybe just maybe, this may not be your situation, but in this situation, this story, I see that God trusted him with this trial. And so this is what I know, okay, I'll tell you this. This is what I know. I'm gonna leave you with a couple application scriptures. Like, what do you do whenever you don't understand? Here it is. Proverbs 3, 5 says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. You see that? Job said, I don't understand. Don't depend on your own understanding. Philippians 4.19 tells us this, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, a lot of people read that and they're like, oh, he's talking about like, you know, riches, like resource. No, 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 all your needs. That means your emotional needs, your relational needs. So God knows the needs that you have and he shall supply all, everybody say all, all your needs. So trusting in God means I trust that he knows what I need to know, Amen. And so sometimes the things that we go through, we just come to the point where it's like, I don't need to understand to trust that God is good even when life is not. But ultimately the story really is a foreshadow of Jesus. Job is a foreshadow of Jesus. He's blameless, he's righteous, he hates evil. He admit, like that is Jesus subjected to the, the, the worst kind of battle. Jesus Christ, a foreshadow of this moment. Jesus who was the most faithful becoming the ultimate warrior divinity becoming humanity. He who knew no sin would become sin. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. I want you to know, friends, no matter what you're going through, Jesus loves you. He's for you, not against you. That greater is he that is in you than he that lives in all the world. That, that, that God who began a good work on the inside of you, he will complete it. I want to tell you, keep on going. Don't give up. Don't quit. No matter what you're facing, keep standing in the face of the battle. Keep coming to Grace Fellowship. Go to Growth Track. Jump on the dream team. Start giving. Start serving. Be who God has called you to be. Build his church in Jesus' name. Amen.